Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice because we have a choice. Amen? Everyone chooses to rejoice or chooses to be miserable. Hallelujah. God is doing mighty things. God is always on the move. And one of the things we want to do is be in his moves. Amen? Amen? But one of the things the enemy wants to do is get you out so you can't get into the move of God. That's the enemy's job. So that you miss the move of God. And when you miss the move of God, you miss a special, not only blessing, but position, a strength, and strategies that he gives each and every one of us. It's almost like missing a next plan if you were building something. And there's multiple sheets of the plan. And what happens is that plan is missed when we miss the next move of God. And God is moving right now. And he doesn't want us to miss it. He wants to bring us into that place where we are surrendered to his move. And willing to shift and move whenever he says so. You know, the worst thing we can be is successful in the wrong assignment. Amen? And we've been successful in many wrong assignments. Every one of us has been successful in a wrong assignment at one time. We thought it was wonderful. We made decisions and realized that those decisions and choices were not working for us anymore. They were working against us. Amen? Amen. But thank God for his mercies and his grace who gives us other opportunities. But that other opportunity is also known as a move of God. And we don't want to miss it. One of the things in these opportunities of the move of God is the area to where you and I must get to a level where we're willing to trust no matter what. We can't all longer live by how we and make decisions by how we feel or what we see. We make decisions according to what he says and what is truth. That is the challenge to each and every one of us on a constant level. God is always bringing us to the place of challenge so that something can be exchanged. Something that was harming us can be exchanged. Something that was promoting the enemy's side instead of God's side can be exchanged. Something that was bringing you sickness can be exchanged. Something that was bringing you bondage can be exchanged. That's why God makes multiple moves. And he does everything he can to cause us to get in position so we don't miss the move of God. Amen? Amen. Would you grab your swords and go to Psalm 149? Psalm 149. In verse 1, we'll read this chapter. Let's speak it together, please. What does it say? Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise in the assembly of the saints. So when we assemble together, we should be praising. That's the purpose. Let Israel, now when we speak of of Israel, also speaks of the body of Christ. So he's speaking to me and you. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. So we come together and we rejoice in the maker. The one that made you and me. The one that holds your breath. The one that holds your future. The one that holds your heart. The one that holds your life. That's who you come in honor. We don't come to honor men. We come to honor him. Let Israel rejoice in their maker and let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with a what? Let them praise his name with a dance. So it's okay to dance. Amen? Some of us need some Holy Ghost aerobics anyways, right? 
Let them sing praises to him with a timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble. Everyone say humble. With salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. And let them sing aloud on their beds. Well, you're not in bed anymore, so you should be able to sing even louder. Amen. Let the high praises of God be in your what? In your mouth. And a two-edged sword in your hand to execute. Everyone say execute. execute. Vengeance on the nations. In other words, on your enemies. The, and punishments on the peoples. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. And to what? Execute on them the written judgment. The written judgment. This honor have all his saints praised the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is he wants me and you to execute righteous judgments on behalf of him. This is an honor. This is a birthright for me and you. When you are born in the Spirit, this is a birthright that you and I should be executing righteous judgments on behalf of the name of the Lord and for his king and for the kingdom. It is your birthright. And what does that really mean? This is not an execution of judgment to where it's criticism. Amen? Amen. This is an execution of judgment but where we judge the truth, everything is a judgment to the truth of God, what has been written of the word of God. All actions, everything that's going on, every decision, everything in people's lives, everything that goes around about you, you are to judge according to its fruit. I've always heard people say, well, you ain't supposed to judge, You let me tell you, homie. I'm going to judge your fruit. Amen. See, that's also a sort of association with discernment. Amen. Jesus never said not to judge. He said, before you judge, make sure you examine yourself and judge. Amen? Amen? Amen. But it's okay to judge. There's nothing wrong with it. You're not condemning. You're judging. Why? For your protection Amen. and for someone else's. Amen. But there is a judgment an executed judgment where you are able to drive out the powers of darkness. Amen. That is your responsibility, to drive out the powers of darkness. Go to Mark 16. It is your birthright. Oh, hallelujah. Everyone say righteous judgments. There's your title. Mark 16. <laughs> oh, glory. In verse 14. You know, when Jesus speaks about the disciples, he speaks about me and you too. Amen? So it's not, I guess so many people, well, it's only for them. No, it's not. Jesus is not, he wasn't, he, he didn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen. In verse 14, it says, he, he appeared later to the 11 as they sat at the table. In other words, when he rose from the dead. And he rebuked them for their unbelief because he had appeared to others already and they didn't believe him. And he told them he would come back, didn't he? He rebuked them for their unbelief and the hardness of their hearts. Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, well, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel is a word in the arena that means the message of the truth. And he who believes, that word believe means to follow. Again, if you're not a follower, you can't be a believer. You can say you believe it, but if you choose not to follow, God says you're a liar. He who believes and is baptized with the Holy Spirit shall be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who follow me. In my name they will what? Cast out demons. Now, I, I, to me, 
so many times it's baffling to me. It's baffling where people who call themselves Christians still don't get this. Because this is your birthright to what? Drive out evil presence. It's amazing in how many Christians still allow evil presence to rule their life, not even knowing that they're there. Causing them to make decisions, causing them to do things, to open more doors of demonic activity in their life. He's, this is the first thing he says, in my name you will cast out devils, demons. In other words, the presence of evil. And you will speak with new tongues. Why? Because you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you will have power. There's no sense of being baptized in the Holy Spirit if you're not willing to drive out powers of darkness. It's a wasted gift. Amen. And you will take up serpents. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to go around looking for snakes and dance with them. Amen. It's also a representation of evil darkness. And if you drink anything deadly, amen, so if you drink something by mistake, you can decree this word. Does everybody get it? It doesn't mean you're going to go siphon gas out of cars and test God. Or drink cyanide like these goofies do. Granolas, nutty and fruity people, dancing with serpents and drinking cyanide calling themselves Christians in these religious cults. It's ridiculous. They do not interpret the word because they don't have the true spirit of God. They got familiar spirits. It's a difference. And you will take up serpents, and if you drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt you. You will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Sometimes it's an instant miracle, but sometimes it's a process of recovering. In this, this is an area where you and I are executing righteous judgment. It is to drive out evil presence of demonic forces in you, in your home, in your possessions, in everything. It is your responsibility and my responsibility. That's how we keep things clean. Does everybody get it? If you're not willing to do that, the enemy will always come in and deceive you. He will come to steal, kill, and destroy because he knows you have power over him. But if you don't take that authority over him, he will take advantage of you. If you're not willing to drive them out, then you harbor them. Amen. Does everybody get it? Amen. If you're not willing to drive them out, you will harbor them, not only in you, but in your home. And you won't even realize they're there. But little by little, they take. Little by little, they cause division. Little by little, they cause sickness. Little by little, they steal. Little by little, they cause you to drift away from the presence of God. Little by little, the next thing you know, you're in worse state than you were before. In Matthew 12. Because why? Execute your birth given right as a born again Christian to execute judgments and drive out the presence of evil. In Matthew 12. Do you understand that this is happening globally? God is bringing, He's executing judgment, righteous judgment. He's executing it. Why? Because he's trying to wake his people up. See, in the Old Testament, demonic forces, demons and devils and so forth, that were possessing people. That's where the word dog comes from in the Bible. It means a demonized person. God, because they weren't casting out devils, so I had to drive the people out. Does everybody get it? In fact, most of them, people don't realize there was a Nephilim race that's been brought down the line. That's why the Lord, you know, people say, man, your God was dangerous. <laughs> said, My God was holy. He was just removing unholiness. But he's merciful and graceful. And Matthew 12 and verse 43, let's speak it. Matthew 12 and verse 43. When a what? 
unclean spirit. That doesn't mean something that's dirty. It means an evil spirit is demon. He's talking about a demon. It's called unclean spirit. A wicked spirit, an evil spirit, a perverse spirit. They're all unclean spirits because anything that's not holy is unclean. Amen. When an unclean spirit does what? Goes out of a man. So he was in the man already. He goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none because they don't rest. They don't sleep. They don't rest. The only time they get rest is when they do evil or they provoke you to react so they can get fed off of you. Verse 43. And he says he finds none. Then he says, I will what? Return to my house. Why? Because he can't get rest without using a human. So he goes out. He gets cast out. He gets removed. But he can't get rest because he's going to get fed by a human. Does everybody understand? Oh, hallelujah. Then he says, I will return to my house. My house means a body from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order but not filled with the spirit of the living God. So even though the presence of evil was removed, the presence of God wasn't replacing it. Then he goes and takes with them seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be even with this wicked generation. Jesus was explaining. That's why when people backslide, they get worse. And the enemy just comes and tries to commit, cause them to commit suicide. Oppression, fear, all of these things. That's all part of demonic forces. Unclean spirit is a demon with an evil presence of influence to provoke a manifestation of an emotional reaction to get fed. That's how they get fed. It's amazing the body of Christ doesn't get this yet. They'll go around dilly-dallying, thinking everything is fine, wondering why stuff is going on in their home, wondering why things ain't right, wondering why they're, they're working their butt off all of their life and never gaining anything, and everything keeps getting stolen because demonic forces are stealing it. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, not God. Amen. He comes to bring you life and life abundantly. But you've got to make a place for him. Either you're allowing a habitation of the presence of evil or a habitation of the king of glory, one or the other. And Matthew 10, you don't have to go there. Jesus said to him, I give you power over unclean spirits. I give you power. But people don't use it. They're still looking carnally. They're still thinking carnally. And Matthew 7, while we're in Matthew... In verse 15, Matthew 7, verse 15. Is everybody okay? What does it say? Beware of what? False prophets, false teachers who come to you, false religions who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. You will know them by their what? Fruit, their character. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree, every, every, every good tree, a word tree means spirit, bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? Cut down and thrown into the fire. He's talking about a human spirit. Therefore, by their fruits you shall not, you shall know them. What's he telling us this for? So your associations are according to the will of God and not according to the will of the devil. It's amazing how many people, Christians, still associate with people that are living a life of fornication, that are lying, stealing, addicted, all kinds of things. They're still associating with them in that arena. Still being 
friendly, still supporting them. You know, we get calls all the time about people that are families that are, have children of addicts. Well, if the person doesn't want help, throw them out. It's real simple. Amen. Why keep them in the house? Now you're harboring a demonized individual. Throw that person out till he wants help or she wants help. Well, what if he dies? He's in the hands of God, not in yours. Amen? Amen? Get him out of your hands and put him in the hands of God. Because you're just harboring demonic presence. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians 11. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Listen, time is short. Things are happening quickly. We want to get in God's move because it's going on. In verse 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. He, if he takes or partakes in an unworthy manner. Now, we know that he's talking about communion when we take the, the juice and the, and the bread. But there's a deeper arena of this. It's an area where if you know the word of God, you know the truth. And you're still doing what isn't right. It's partaking it in an unworthy manner. Is everybody okay? Oh, hallelujah. Let's go a little further. What does he say in verse 28? But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. In other words, examine yourself. That's why before you take communion, you better examine yourself. Am I doing what's right before? Am I stealing? Am I tithing? Am I stealing from God? Am I doing what's right before? Am I still associating with things I shouldn't be doing? Oh, I'm waiting for healing. Well, you ain't never going to get healed. You keep doing that stuff. You're going to bring a curse on yourself. Is everybody Okay. Verse 29, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. Drinks judgment to himself. Not discerning the Lord's body. Wow. Look at what the result is. For this reason, many are what? Weak and sick among you and many sleep. In other words, many die. For if you would judge yourself, you would not be judged. Whoa. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Wow. That we may not be condemned with the world. Hmm. Examine or judge your fruits. Examine and judge your attitude and motive. <clears throat> Examine your desires. Examine what decision you're going to make. Examine to see if it's influenced by an evil presence. Examine yourself. Are you a fearful person? Are you an anxious person? Is there a deception there? Are you rebellious? Is there sin there? Is there sickness? What is presence? Is there sin present? What is there that's present that's causing these things in your life? And drive it out. Does everybody get it? Drive it out. Listen, we have a penetrating prayer book that can drive out any demon. You just got to speak it. And you got to believe it, and you speak it until it's gone. Amen. Don't go, oh, you speak it once. Why ain't nothing happened? That's no faith at all. You're expecting God to move on something that you haven't built enough faith up for him to move. Amen? Amen. Examine yourself. 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> Listen, this is training for reigning. 
God is training his people up. He's kicking us out of the nest, out of the comfort zone. And say, come on, I want you to drive out these demonic forces. But let's get them out of you first. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Let's speak it. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested. Who was manifested? Jesus was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. There is the answer. If you're truly abiding in him, what does he mean by abiding in him? In his presence, in his word, in his assembly. If you're abiding. You know, most people can't make it going to church once a week. <laughs> they can't. I know I can't. I got to get in God's presence at least two or three times a week, man. Not only from my home, but in the wor corporate worship. Because that's how you change. It says, whoever abides in him doesn't see sin. In other words, whoever abides in him will have the discernment and understanding, know who they are, their true identity, and be able to execute righteous judgment by driving out demonic forces. He'll know that they're there because the presence of God is on him more. The more that God's presence is on you, the more things are more exposed. You know, you go into a house that's got a little dim light, you can't see so much. The brighter the light, the more you see. So the more presence God's on you, the more you're able to see. Other than that, you can't see nothing. And you walk in deception. And you think you're doing the right thing. Gosh, Lord, I hope I'm doing this. What's your will? And there's always fear involved. See, the enemy's greatest weapon is deception, and its power is fear. That's how he manipulates people. Fear, fear of lack, fear of not having, fear of not pleasing, fear. Fear, anxiety, stress, anxiousness, worry, panic attacks. You know how many believers they have panic attacks? It's incredible to me. That's a stinking demon, and they still don't get it. They still don't get it. That's what a panic attack. Do you know that asthma is caused from a presence of a spirit of fear? But they'd rather take the medication or an anxiety pill that just brings them more into bondage instead of getting rid of that spirit. Because, see, they're really not fighters. God wants strong fighters to rise up against these demonic forces. They did it in the Old Testament, but they wiped out people. Because they're, see, because they were harboring demons in them, so they had to get removed too. Thank God it's not like that today. Although sometimes it is. Sometimes it happens that way. Amen? Is everybody okay? All glory. First John chapter 3. Let's go a little further. <clears throat> and verse 8. He who sins is what? Oh, uh, verse 7, I'm sorry. Little children, let no one what? deceive you. He who practices righteousness is what? Righteous, just as he is righteous. So he who practices or executes righteous judgment and who has the fruits of righteousness because they're not your fruits, that is presence of God's fruits in you. Amen? He who practices righteousness is righteous. Why? Because that person is abiding. He who sins, verse 8, is of the devil. In other words, presence of evil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In other words, you must play your part. He did it. Now you got the other part. You must continue it. People are still calling out on the name of Jesus. And don't get me wrong. He answers us. But most of the time, he's going to answer you and say, Use my word. Because people are going, why hasn't he answered me yet? And he's saying, because you haven't used my word yet. Why don't you drive out the presence of evil? Drive it out. Drive it out of you. Drive it out of your home. Drive it out of the possessions that you bring in your home. Those are called accursed items. You don't even realize how much witchcraft is put on everything. Do you know that they give children in other countries, young children, 
They give them candy, soda, whatever, to pray over things and curse it. They teach them witchcraft. You know how many shells you brought home that were accursed? How many things that you brought home from other countries if you've been on vacation that were accursed items? And then you got to hang on your wall. You don't even realize it. You know how many people are still using those dream catchers, thinking it's moving away demonic forces when it's actually drawing them? I see them hanging. I see a, uh, 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 a Christian fish on a back bumper, and I see a, uh, uh, a dream catcher hanging in their car. I'm thinking, what an idiot. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I see them even selling them. And they're, crying, and they're teaching Bible studies in schools, and in their Sunday schools, and, so, and they're selling dream catchers. It's plumb nuts. God is saying, come on. Come on, wake up from this. Word, why don't you know my word? Amen? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. In verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin. In other words, he doesn't let sin rain on him because he's filled with the presence of God. He doesn't let the evil presence of evil influence him. He's always driving him out. For his seed remains. See, the devil comes to kill the Steal the seed of God in you. If he can take it, a person gives up Jesus and begins to serve darkness. Oh, hallelujah. And this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested. And whoever does not, verse 10, and whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Wow. This is reality. Sin is lawlessness, as known as the presence of evil. You know, many people think because they produce good that it's righteousness. It isn't. Good comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Righteousness comes from the tree of life. You can't produce good. You can only produce righteousness. Now, your works may be good, but your fruits are righteousness. Does everybody get it? That's the difference. And why? Because... We execute the righteous judgment by driving out demonic presence. Driving out demonic presence. You know those religious occults that come around your house and knock on the door? They're always trying to leave you a pamphlet. That's an accursed item. The word says take no other doctrine into your home. But see, people don't know that. They bring all kinds of stuff in their home. It's an accursed item. It draws demonic activity. And now you, next thing you know, you're doing stuff. You don't even realize it. Oh, it's just a book. No, it's an accursed item. Oh, it's a piece of jewelry. No, it's an accursed item. And you are allowing that demonic forces to come in your home to steal, kill, and destroy. It's an accursed item. Dragons are accursed items. Certain logos are accursed items. In fact, God warned Joshua. And Joshua 7.7, 7, you take your time and read it. Talks about accursed items. Look, and anything that God doesn't approve of, you shouldn't. Amen? 1 Samuel 15. Listen, they don't wait for an invitation. And they don't need one. They access no matter what, whatever they try to do. If you see shadows walking through your home, you see them out of the corner of your eye, you know you got demons in your house. You sense an irritation, anger, hatred, jealousy, things that have to agree, things that are not peace. If you're out of peace, joy, and righteousness, then you know you got a devil around you or in you. Oh, Glory. That's why we should be joyful all the time. In fact, joy is good medicine, isn't it? Joyful heart. 1 Samuel 15, verse 17. Now Samuel, a prophet, was speaking to the king of Israel. His name was Saul, and he disobeyed God. And Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord God anoint you king over Israel? And now the Lord sent you on a mission. Everyone say mission. 
Everyone say, I'm on a mission that I must fulfill. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the what? Sinners. These were Nephilim. These were giants also. They were the, the, fa the family of them. The Amalekites and fight against them until they are, are what? Consumed. Why, did, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul, the king, answered the prophet Samuel and said, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back King Agag, king of Amalek. Did he tell him to bring back the king? No, he told him to kill him. See, that's called compromise. See, when you compromise, you already opened the door to the enemy. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Amalekites verse 21. But the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. He was making excuses. He compromised and made excuses. Why? He didn't fulfill what God asked him to do. So Samuel said to him, Is the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of the rams. For rebellion, everyone say rebellion, yeah. is as a sin of witchcraft. So was he rebellious? Yeah. Yes. Rebellion will always open the door to demonic activity. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, I also reject you from being king. In other words, being king, the word king now represents warrior. In other words, you will not be able to defeat your enemies. Does everybody see this? And then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared. I did what? I feared. There's that fear again. Remember Satan's greatest weapon, weapon is deception and his power is fear. He utilizes fear. Utilizes Fear all the time to manipulate people. And because I feared, right, the people and obeyed their voice instead of the voice of the Lord. Wow. Now, I want you to see what happens here. Saul rejected the voice of God. He rejected to execute righteous judgment, didn't he? He didn't do a self-examination too much either. Go to... Uh, 16, chapter 16. Chapter 16 and verse 14. This is what happened when obedience and stubbornness comes. Are you ready? Can you handle this? In verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord did what? Departed from Saul. Why? Because of rebellion and disobedience. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. A distressing spirit is called a spirit of fear. A distressing spirit. I want you to know that Saul had panic attacks constantly now. Does everybody get it? Do you ever hear about people having panic attacks? Being stressful or anxious? All of those things. Because a distressing spirit came. Because the presence of God lifted because, see, God knows that you have a call in your life. The demons know you have a call in your life. And so when they know that you've been called and you've accepted their call, now you're compromising it and playing games with it. And the, they wait for the presence of God to lift from you, and they come and they begin to eat you. Eat you right up. Cause panic so they can cause an action and get fed. Amen? It's called a re reaction, isn't it? Does everybody see this? Powerful. Now look at what happened. And in verse 15, and Saul's servants said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. A spirit of fear is troubling you. Even his servants saw it and knew it. 
Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that when he plays with his hand, when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, you shall be what? Well, because it will drive out the distressing spirit. Does everybody get it? So that presence of God through praise and worship, when the presence of God comes, it begins to drive out demonic forces. So the more that you stay in God's presence, the more freer you'll become. With the lack of God's presence, the more distressed you come. Does everybody get this? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> it's amazing how many people don't get it. The presence of God lifted. The presence of fear came with panic attacks, anxiety, stress, worry, torment, anger, lying, delusion, false perceptions. All of these things. And they all are utilized to protect one another. Do you ever get around somebody who's got a bad attitude all the time? Angry? Reacts real easy? Spear of fear is there. Only the presence of God can come and relieve that person through worship unless somebody else drives it out. But even when another person drives it out, if that person doesn't get into God's presence and stay filled, that spirit comes back. That's why people lose their healing. That's why they lose their deliverance. That's why they lose their freedom. That's why they go back into bondage again. Is everybody okay? They're not willing to execute their righteous judgment. If you are at a point where you can't praise the Lord, you are hindered by an evil presence. Amen? You're hindered by an evil presence. There's a lot of people who can fake praise from the head. But there must be a pure praise from the heart. That's a difference. Isaiah 45. Righteous judgment. Isaiah 45. That's why you hear a lot of people, I don't understand why that person blew it. He's been coming to presence. He's been coming to, to uh, service. I don't understand why they can do it. Because they were praising out of their head and not out of the pureness of their heart. In verse 18. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, and who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be what? Inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in the dark place of earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain, I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations, they have no knowledge, who carry wood, the wood of their carved image and pray to the God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this form from ancient time? Who has told it from at that time, have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and Savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be what? Saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That to me, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incest against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. God executes righteous judgments to those rebellious according to his truth. In hope that self-examination will come and reality to drive out the presence of evil. Amen? That's why there's such a shaking now. 
in Ephesians chapter 4. Hallelujah. In verse 25, Ephesians 4, 25. Therefore, put in away lie and let each of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and don't what? Sin. That's called righteous anger. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the what? Nor give place to the devil. You know how many people give place to the devil? And don't even realize it because they're, they're trying to, they're, they're about self. So they go out and get tattoos, opens the door to demonic activity. They pierce their tongues, opens the door to demonic activity. Why? Because that's serpent tongue. They do all kinds, they, they, they listen to music, opens the door to demonic activity. They go to movies that open the door to demonic activity. Cigarettes, alcohol, all of these things that open the door to demonic activity. Fornication, a lack of, abide, lack of abiding in God's presence. All of these things, associations, pornography, all of these things open the door to demonic activity. Those which, brings, which are called the cursed items. It says, make no place for the devil. Make no place for the devil. Everyone say, make no place for the devil. Hmm. Make no place for the devil. I like that. Verse 28. And let him who stole steal no longer. In other words, don't make a place by stealing for the devil. Because when you're stealing, you're actually stealing for the devil. You know, it's amazing how many drug dealers think they're okay because they're not using. It's like a bartender. A bartender thinks they're okay because they're not drinking it. But it says, woe to the bartenders who give strong drink. Because they approve of something that God disapproves of. Hello? Let them who stole steal no longer, but rather let them labor working with his hands. What is good that he may have something to give him who has need. People can't hold jobs. They can't even hold jobs. Because they're so messed up because of the demonic presence. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You know, people don't like to hear, you got a devil. Boy, they get upset. Man, you got a demon. You're out of your mind. <laughs> Snap. <laughs> like I said, <laughs> you got a demon. Where? <laughs> Don't take it personal. It's about kingdom business. <laughs> no, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not what? Grieve, grieve the Holy Spirit. Man, you grieve the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he steps out. Guess who comes? Mr. and Mrs. Fear. Anxiety, stress, panic, deception, delusion, false. You can't interpret things correctly. What does the word say? It says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. Sound mind, sound mind, sound mind. When the spirit of fear is there, there is no sound mind. You a cuckoo. Hello? Praise God. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Why? Because that's a, so that's a fruits of a demon. And be kind. Well, that's a fruit of God. To one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Wow. <laughs> because of not exercising or executing righteous judgment, again, if you're not willing to drive out them, then you are harboring them. 
Is everybody okay? Hebrew 10. Hebrew, did Hebrew this morning for you? I, Hebrew this morning for me. <laughs> Hebrew 10. I only have one cup of coffee. That's all I need. <laughs> one cup of coffee with six, no. <laughs> Six shots of espresso. No. <laughs> no, man. I'd be, there'd be six more walls in this. I mean, six more doors in this room. <laughs> Hebrews 10 and verse 19. You don't want to be addicted to caffeine. Amen? 10. Hebrews 10. Nothing wrong with a cup, though, you know? Or two. <laughs> Maybe three out of a day. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. You know, some people have like in the morning. And then they crash. And they're miserable. Man. And then you tell them they have a demon. And they go drink all, more coffee. Hallelujah. See, the fruit of the Spirit is to have control over yourself. If you don't have control over yourself, someone does. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Uh, Hebrews 10, verse something. Is everybody there? 19. Let's speak it. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to what? Enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new way and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that it is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, what he's saying is, he's talking about the, Holiest, that's the third chamber of the tabernacle. He's saying, press in. Get in there. Why? Because when you get in there, things begin to leave. Amen. The outer court, demons don't leave. Only in the holy place, in the most holy place, will demons begin to go. Not in the outer court. That's why every Christian is carrying a bunch of demons when they first get saved. Or they all be gone, wouldn't they? Because they've never made it to the second chamber or the third chamber. Remember, everything revolves around the tabernacle of God. Oh, glory. Are you ready? Should we go a little further? Okay. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not what? Forsaking assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now he's going to tell you, look, and this is what happens when there's a lack of assembling. For if we sin, what? Willfully. Will After we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a, a sacrifice for sins. See, there's a place that God has sanctified for you already in the second and third chamber of the tabernacle. The holiest of holies has been sanctified for me and you so that we can go in there. And so freedom can come. Oh, glory. But if you willfully sin because you lack the presence of God. Verse 27, it says, and because you've done this, there's no longer a sacrifice. In other words, the presence of God is lifted. But a certain fearful expectation of what? 
judgment, in fearful indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who's rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? That's powerful. That blows the theology of one saved, always saved, doesn't it? Well, I've been saved 30 years. Bummer, you're still the same. Amen? Amen? 30 years saved, still can't cast out the devil or self-examine. Sometimes you just need to look in the mirror and look in your own eyes and get rid of what's ever winking at you. <laughs> Verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fearful. So we don't want that, do we? Amen? If you'll judge yourself, you won't have to wait for him to judge you. Does everybody get it? Psalm 67. Righteous judgment. Start executing them. It is your birthright. Oh, Jesus knows my heart. Yes, he does. <laughs> Have you heard him say, yo, moron, wake up. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many of y'all know arthritis is a spirit? Yeah, it's the spirit of arthritis. Pain, pain is a spirit. These are spirits. They'll lodge in any part of your body that you let them. When you sense something, don't go, oh, gosh, man. Come against it. No, I'm not accepting that. Listen, you're supposed to be living from above. Why are we driving out demonic forces to bring heaven on earth? And if you're not willing to drive out demonic forces, then you're allowing, you're preventing heaven from coming to earth and fulfilling the kingdom and its purpose. Every one of us is supposed to do our part. Psalm 67. Let's speak it. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God, and let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on the earth. This is happening now. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her fruit, her increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God bless, shall bless us. And let all the earth and the ends of the earth shall what? Fear, fear him. One of the things that fear of the Lord comes by the presence of God. And the fear of the Lord doesn't mean you're afraid. It means you honor, respect him, and reverence him of who he is. But there's a place of relationship where God is not just God. He's not just Savior. He's not just King. He's not just the Lord of the army. He's Dad. He's my Dad. And when he comes to the place that he's your Dad, you fight for your family. You fight for your family. What family? Your family from heaven. Remember, Jesus was out at a meeting, and he was preaching, and his mother and brothers and so sisters were waiting to come in to see him and talk to him. And they came and told him. And he said, listen, my mother, brothers, and sisters are the ones that do the will of God. They are you. Not that those who don't will do the will of God. There's a difference. It's time to become more serious about your walk. Amen? We have a mission to finish, to fulfill. 
I mean, let's think about the end result. You're not going to be here forever. And you will stand before the throne room of God that is built by justice and righteousness. Everyone. So why wait for God to judge you? Start judging yourself. Amen? And I'm going to close it. Revelation 3. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 3. We are a training ministry to train warriors. I encourage you, take notes so you can teach. Everyone's called to be a teacher. <laughs> Revelation 3, verse 7. And it says to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, these things says, he who is holy, he who is true, and he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. I see I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, wait a minute. He said, because you have kept my word to what? Persevere. It's going to rescue you from the hour of trial. Hmm. But the rest of the world will be tested because the trial will come. Verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. And he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Righteous, righteous, righteous judgments. It's time to execute your birth given righteous. Amen. Amen. If you're not willing to drive them out, then you are harboring them. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. And we ask that you protect this word and bring to our remembrance, Holy Spirit. Quicken us. Just speak to us, Holy Spirit, and say, drive out. Anything that comes, tell us to just drive out. So we will be able to execute righteousness on your behalf for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.